So this video we're going to talk about a few different study flow engineering devices. Um, so there'll be like four of them. So I'm not going to do a problem after each one because, well, at some point you're going to get bored of just doing a billion problems and not all of these are like necessary good problems in and of themselves. So the first one is a throttling valve. What does that look like? Well, it can be an adjustable valve. It can be a porous plug. It can be a capillary tube. What the heck's a capillary tube? We'll talk about that in a moment. What does it do? Well, it's a kind of flow restricting device. And what it does is it causes a significant drop in pressure. Okay, why do I want that? Well, you want that in your bathtub because you don't necessarily want the water to be shooting at you with at 60 PSI. Maybe you want to slow it down a little bit. And so you use an adjustable valve to tell it how much water can come through and you're reducing the pressure when you do that. Okay, so what's the difference between a turbine and a throttling valve? Well, first off, do you see any way for me to attach a generator to any of these? The answer is no, like I don't have a generator attached to any of these, so I can't produce power using a throttling valve. Like that's not its goal. The other thing is that the pressure drop in the fluid is often accompanied by a large drop in temperature. And so, you know, like large drop in temperature, where would I want that? Your refrigerator, also your air conditioner. They use these all the time. And so because of that, what I get is a really cool detail. For a throttling valve, any sort of throttling valve, you'll find that the enthalpy is more or less constant. Is it exactly constant? No, now, there is a slight amount of enthalpy change, but it's so small that we can say, eh, it's more or less constant. And as a note, capillary tubes are what your fridge actually uses. It's just a really, really tiny tube. And so you go from a high pressure to a low pressure. And your whole fridge works because in the freezer, you go from high pressure to low pressure. And so it goes from a liquid, that's supposed to be a liquid, beautiful drawing here, to a gas. And when it goes from liquid to a gas inside that tube, it absorbs energy. And so energy leaves your freezer, goes into the flow, and then behind your fridge, you're actually looking at it from behind, you'll see all these wires sometimes with older fridges. Sometimes those are hidden underneath your fridge somewhere. But either way, inside of these places, the pressure is increased. And what's happening is it's going from being a vapor to a liquid. And when it goes from vapor to a liquid, it has to release energy. When it releases that energy, it heats up your house, keeps the fridge, out, everything outside the fridge warm, and hopefully keeps everything inside the fridge cold. So it's cool stuff. Okay, next one, mixing chambers. You're like, is this all about showers? Kind of, kind of. I mean, like you have a throttling valve in your shower and guess what? You've got a mixing chamber too, especially if you've got the two handle ones. So what's a mixing chamber? Well, it's simply where I take two different flows with different enthalpies and I mix them together so that they have one flow with the same enthalpy. So that can be as simple as a T elbow right here. I've got hot water on one side, cold water on the other. And what comes out of my shower is not like perfectly half hot, half cold. No, it is mixed together. And so it is all one temperature. It is uniform. Sometimes we actually have real chambers and sometimes they're connected, like where the fluid's directly mixing. There's lots of other ways it can happen though. When I have a mixing chamber, the big thing for us is that if I have M.1 on one side and have M.2 on the other, well, my mass flow rate that's coming out, I'll say this mass final, is gonna be equal to both of those added together. We don't have any like nuclear physics happening. We don't have matter disappearing. It's all gonna come out at the end. So that's the biggest detail for us. We can also realize that conservation energy says that my energy flow from this first part, my energy flow from this second part would also be added together in the end. Okay. Heat exchangers. I think this is a kind of a weird looking one. I mean, it is actually used in many applications, but still it looks kind of weird. Um, this is kind of how heat is moved around inside your computer. Not a hundred percent. I'm just giving you my best, like, you know, analysis where you would see something like this. Or at least something you would see like this in your everyday life. Okay. What is it? Well, it's simply moving heat between two fluid streams without mixing. We do not want those fluid streams to touch. We want energy to go from one to the other. Maybe we want to cool the hot fluid. Maybe we want to heat the cold fluid, whatever it is. 
we want them to be connected in that way. But we don't want to mix the fluids together because we need to keep them separate for whatever reason. These are used everywhere, everywhere. If you go into thermodynamics two, you're actually going to see this a ton because we use this all the time for something called regeneration. If you have an engine, there is a very, very important detail. So at one point, the energy is going to come out. And at one point, the air is going to come in. And the air that's coming in is cold. There, coil. I can spell, I promise you, I'm an engineer, but I can spell. And the air that's coming out of it is hot from your engine. The issue is that when I'm adding heat, the colder my air is to start, the less energy I got by adding heat to it. So it'd be really nice if that cold air was not cold, but was actually warm. And the second thing is that hot air that I've been shooting out, well, the hotter it is, the more energy I didn't actually get to use in making power. So what I would really like is for that to be cooler. It'd be nice if it could be warm. And so what we do is we say, okay, well, why don't I use some of this hot air to heat up the cold air? And so we do that. That's something called regeneration. It's a fantastic thing, and it increases the efficiency of engines. Okay. Now, here's my last little detail before we do an example problem in the next video. Um, when I'm talking about heat transfer for a heat exchanger, it all depends on where you look at your control volume. So if you look right here, my control volume includes everything. So this pipe with fluid A and this whole system with fluid B, they're both inside of my control volume. And because they're both inside my control volume, there is no heat transfer because all that matters is what heat is going through the boundary and my boundary is way out here. There's no heat going outside of this boundary. In the second problem, I draw my boundary right here just around pipe A. And so in this case, I do have heat crossing the boundary because it's going from fluid B into fluid A or vice versa. So how you choose your boundary, it won't make or break a problem. It can make it easier or harder. You can solve it either way, but you have to think about what you're doing um, and be consistent the entire time. Okay, with that being said, let's try out an example using a problem just like this. Thank you so much. I'll see you all in just a moment. Bye-bye.